Uh, my name's Elijah Meeks. Uh, I work in the university, and I work in a library in the university. I'm at Stanford. Uh, we work in, I do software development for something called the Digital Humanities, which is using data visualization and computational methods for the exploration of traditional humanities scholarship. Um, if this website up here doesn't ever open up, then this will be a shorter talk, which I think is fine, but we'll see. And so what I'm here to talk about is the same thing as Stuart, though, which is D3 as a community, uh, based on analysis of sort of some data that we got about the community. Um, community of code, a community of practice, and a community of aspiration. I think that that really sort of defines D3. And what I originally hoped for was what you see over on the side here, higher than expected betweenness for friends, bicycling, and photography, um, which was some initial results that I got out of an analysis of one of the data sets we're looking at. I got two data sets, one thanks to Ian, the D3 uh, meetup group user list and your introductions when you joined the group. Uh, it also included the interests that you had in common, and that's where those interests came from build a great big network out of it, find out which interests had particularly high centrality in that network despite the fact that, or unexpectedly high centrality, so that I could tell you guys what you need to go out now and do is buy a camera, get a tandem bicycle, and you'll succeed in the D3 community. <laughs> so like classic, classic uh, use of analytics to, to do evil and maximize profit, right? Um, this is a very bad Yakov Shmirnov joke, but anybody who's a connoisseur of Yakov Shmirnov jokes knows that most of them don't actually follow the right pattern. Um, I'm spying on you, right? I mean, I'm using the techniques that people use to spy on you, but you're spying on yourself by telling me all of these interests that you have and all of this text that you write into fields on various parts of the internet, Meetup being one of them. And I'm doing it for what I hope are relatively good reasons. One of them, I want to understand the community. And one of the reasons I want to understand the community is because I'm writing a book about D3. I'm writing D3JS in action, uh, which is, tries to be a deep dive into D3. And I wanted to know, you know what my audience is. Because if we base what the D3 community is off of what we hear on or what we read on the, uh, the Google group, or what we see on Twitter, then we think the D3 community is basically Jason Davies, Mike Bostock, Ian, Miles, Kai Chang, and a couple other people doing awesome stuff, right? So I have to write a book for these five people doing amazing stuff. It's probably, they probably don't need the book. Um, but I wanted to know what the rest of the community looked like. And so we're going to get into some methods that I used and some visualizations. And it looks like not the interactive component to see what, what we could get out of that. The second thing I wanted to do was I wanted to actually understand how D3 was being written. I wanted to know um, on the ground how people are actually writing code, what kind of functions they're using in tandem with other, with other functions. And to do that, I had access to another data set. Uh, Irene Ross made something called Block Explorer that I'm sure a few of you have heard of. We talked about it at the D3 Unconference, and she got on an airplane and wrote the whole thing. And what it does is it takes a list of users and it goes on to GitHub, and it collects all of the gists that they've written, and it finds out what D3 functions they used in each block. So I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to motivate change. right? If there were places where it seemed like the way that we were using code uh, was limited, I wanted to point that out. And I wanted to just sort of make people aware of it, rather than say, well, here's, here's what you should fix. Rather, make that accessible and visible so that people could go and see maybe how they're writing code, what kind of blocks they're making, what kind of visualizations they're making, and whether or not it had common uh, recipes, and maybe influence people to step outside of these common recipes. And that'll make a little more sense as we, get for as we move forward. And then more than that, uh, an interest to me from a social justice perspective is just to educate people, just to really make you aware of what all of this data can say about you more and more because people don't seem to understand how much you can, you can draw from just uh, the text that you write in, in an intro field or the interest that you link to when you join a meetup group. And I think that that sort of goes beyond the D3 community and just uses this community as sort of an example of it. And how did I do that? I did it with networks. Networks are magic, and they show you all sorts of awesome information. I didn't really do it with networks. We're going to see a few networks here. And on the right, 
There's a network visualization that deals with a natural language processing technique that I used to, to look at the data here. Something called topic modeling. So on the left is just some network out of some of the exploration that I, that I did. It doesn't really matter. There's some circles. There's some lines. You all know what networks look like. You can make networks out of anything. The D3 meetup data is pretty good at making networks. You can make a network of people that are connected to each other by shared interests. You can make a network of people that are connected to each other by shared zip codes. Uh, what I show in the network visualization on the right, though, is a representation of the results of a topic model. And so a topic model is a form of natural language processing that takes unstructured text, like the text that you put in your introduction when you join the meetup group, and it tries to find groups of highly co-located words. And so it takes text like what you see on the left. Um, I've highlighted on the bottom. I don't know who Danny is, and I'm not trying to shame anyone, but sometimes these introductions or sometimes the text you put up there isn't very useful, doesn't have much content to it. So in this case, it says hi. Uh, and it tries to find words that commonly occur with other words within that block of text. And so I like to show that instead of as this output, the sort of block of the topics, these collections of highly co-located words, uh, instead of just sort of text like that, I like to show it as a network because it better explains what a topic model actually does. So in a topic model, you have documents. Those documents sometimes are books. Those documents are sometimes tweets. In this case, the documents are your introduction to the D3 meetup group. It finds topics that are highly represented within those documents. Those topics in red up here are made up of words in blue. So in some cases, topics share words. Documents share topics. And it's this natural tripartite network. So when I was looking at the network that was created out of shared interests, I expected to find a really cool network where it turned out people who had Shiba Inus were really into Python, but not so much into data analytics. And it would come up with something, something really simple and straightforward and readable like this network up here, where you can see in blue we have people, in red you have interests. So you can see that three, four people share sustainable living in green markets as an interest. And then two of them also share green entrepreneurs as an interest, and so on. And you could find some kind of structure to the community based on their shared interest. The reality, as many of us find out when we look at uh, a lot of networks, is that most of the network looked like this, this huge blob of lots and lots of co-located interest. And from a network perspective, it wasn't very useful. So when I was looking at the interests, the shared interests of, of the meetup group, it produced the classic hairball network diagrams that aren't very useful. And instead, it became more useful as just a sort of census of what interests people had. So of the 1,900 people here, 1,000 of them said that they were interested in data visualiz visualization and JavaScript, and so on, all the way down the line. And it's pretty straightforward. It's what you would expect for the sort of interests of this meetup group. You see down near the bottom of this list, Python with 450 people associated with it. Python will show up again. I think it's interesting that, that the community is made up of different groups of practice, some of which think of Python as the sort of part of the processing technique. I typically deal with databases and SQL in, in the processing and to, to deal with my data. And then we find of the 1,900 people that are in the meetup group, 49 of them are interested in GIS, geographic information systems, and 42 of them are interested in mapping. And we run into the problem of whether or not this is good data or bad data. But either way, it's kind of surprising, considering how many maps show up on Christoph's gallery of D3 visualizations, how many maps I'm sure you can think of that, are, that, that utilize D3, that there's very little representation of the traditional mapping community, at least by self-identification of interests within the D3 community. And this bears out as we start to look at the actual text. Um, this is actually interactive on this website. You'll see the address in a couple more slides. This is another way of representing topic models. I find this to be a more useful way of representing topic models because a topic is not just made up of certain words, but certain frequencies of those word tokens within the text. So here's a sample of the 30 topics that I derived from this D3 meetup group. Here are uh, seven, eight, sorry, starting with zero, topics that, that uh, the NLP technique identified. And you can see immediately, you can start to already identify certain 
kinds of language, right? These are just words that show up around each other. But they indicate people who are introducing themselves as, as individuals from academia, individuals from startups, people who are coming at this from a more traditional develop, developer background. I think that as we identify those communities within D3, we can try to affect some, some seams between them, identify not only um, where their interests co-locate, co but also where their code is in common. So maybe we can make stronger bonds between these disparate communities, find the people who are highly represented in both communities to act as ambassadors and force them to get up here and talk. We shouldn't rely on volunteer efforts. Um, and I'm sorry, because I was going to flip over to an interactive bit, but uh, you'll have to do that yourself. Topic modeling ultimately, I'll take questions at the end. Topic modeling ultimately is a very simple NLP technique about counting words. It simply counts words that show up around each other. Another very simple uh, uh, NLP, natural language processing technique, is to simply count words. So in all of the introductions that everybody gave, these are some of the groups of words that showed up. So data showed up 552 times, the word data. JavaScript or JS showed up 156 times, and so on. Interestingly, um, mapping map or GIS shows up 42 times, which I thought was cute because like 42 times is the number of people who actually claim mapping is an interest. So maybe map people are very studious about what they write down in their introduction, whereas Python people aren't. Python people figure like, Look, there's one place for me to put my interests. That's in the interests. There's another place for my introduction. I don't have to mention Python again. I mentioned it in my interests. Because there's only 17 mentions of Python or Pi in the introduction text. There's research. Um, again, just like Stuart was pointing out, uh, startup founder or entrepreneur shows up 100, or 92 times. These different communities that are represented in these rooms that you know from interaction with people. And like I said, I would have had an inter interactive component here, but uh, I'll just move forward to the, uh, to the other kind of analysis that I did. Right, my stuff, unlike Stuart, I don't think mobile first, so my stuff doesn't work in mobile, so it won't be fun. No, it's all right, I'll just, I'll just give the talk, and I'll pretend that it was spectacular, and then when you guys go home and say, this isn't really nearly as fun <laughs> as he made it sound. So the other data set that I used was Irene Ross's Block Explorer. And I can't jump to Block Explorer to show you how it works, but what happens is you type in uh, a function in D3, and it shows you all of the blocks that use that function. So if you type in d3.geom.voronoi, it shows you all the blocks that used d3.geom.voronoi with a big asterisk. And that asterisk is that it's a self-identified uh, set of users from GitHub. So there are only 26 users who have so far signed up for it. So you see how it's used for those 26 users. <clears throat> Still, the data set covers 2,000 blocks. And that's a decent sized data set to do some of this analysis. And I built another network, another co-occurrence network. And you see it over here, same colors but different objects. In blue now, we have functions like d3.layout.tree, d3.svg.diagonal, and they're connected to blocks where those functions are used. So we can see that there are eight blocks that use both d3.layout.tree and d3.svg.diagonal. There's actually more, but some of those are also using d3.svg.diagonal.radial, so it's being dragged over that way. And we can see how functions sometimes form these communities, these similar sets of, of short pieces of D3 code, <clears throat> and try to identify whether or not there's, there's some recognizable structure to the way people go about writing their code. I deal with these networks in a uh, network analysis package, a toolkit called Gephi, G-E-P-H-I dot org. It handles larger networks. So, you know, D3 kind of, can kind of get uh, slow with large networks, and Gephi and Pyac and these kind of packages can deal with half a million nodes, a million nodes, 20 million edges. And that allows me to sort of format this stuff and deal with it and find interesting structure. And then I wrote a small library that's poorly documented called Gexif D3 that allows you to export those from Gephi as a graph XML format, so a Gexif um, 
and then just load it up in D3. And it's a shame because, so here's this page I was talking about, emeeks.github.io slash introspect, and that has the topic model viewer. It has this network. It's a thousand nodes. It's a thousand blocks all connected to each other by shared um, functions. And it's a mixed uh, rendering, so the nodes are rendered in SVG, but the edges are rendered in Canvas. So for 1,000 nodes, it's actually pretty zippy. Um, and you can hover over the nodes and find out what other blocks are connected to that block based on these shared connections. And then at the bottom of the screen, there's an actual brush that allows you to um, reduce the edge weight. So you could only see the blocks that are connected to each other by five shared uh, uh, functions or 20 or five or less or between five and 10 and watch as that structure changes. And what you notice here is that this big blob down here is the island of strange projections, right? I don't know how familiar you guys are with blocks, but you'll remember that there are some blocks that use these, these odd uh, geo projections, all of the extended projections like, um, I don't know, az azimuthal equidistant and, and um, plate curry and everything like that. And they're commonly using all of the same functions, and they live over in this edge. And they're all just, for the most part, Mike Bostock playing around with different geo projections to do slightly different things. They're connected into the larger community by their common use of what? D3.geo.projection, D3.geo.path, and so on. Up on the top left is the traditional charting that we think of that uses axes and it uses linear scales and it uses um, what's the other common scale that everybody uses, ordinal scales. And you can see when you go there and, and interact with it <clears throat> that there are strong connections between the use of these of particular scales with particular um, SVG components or particular behaviors. And you can see also that there are really interesting lack of connections between them. One of the reasons why I created a network diagram that has a brush at the bottom and actually uses zoom, so you can zoom in and zoom out, is because there are very few examples of d3.layout.force along with d3.behavior.zoom and d3.behavior.brush. And you have to ask yourself why. Is it because we just sort of go on there and we look at a force layout and we say, okay, I want to make a force layout. I made a force layout. It's got all of the things that I saw Mike build a force layout with. I feel pretty good. I'll drop that in a page somewhere and I'm done. And if that's the case, maybe we should start to think that zoom isn't really a geo function and you see that it's highly associated with the geo functions, but rather it's a useful function for all sorts of different data visualization. <clears throat> so I encourage you to play with this and come up with some other patterns that you might recognize within there. I promise it's interactive. It doesn't get much prettier than that, but it has some stuff that if you click on things and drag things around, it looks good. And there's another network that comes out of this, of course, right? When you take a bipartite network, a network of blocks connected to functions, then you can create a single part network of blocks connected to blocks by shared functions, you can also do the reverse. You can create a network of functions connected to functions by shared blocks. And what you end up seeing is a network of the functions. There's only 240 or so functions represented. And you can see how they're connected to each other by the number of blocks where they co-occur with some other function. And again, you can see in this page the, the brush. So if you look down at the bottom of the page, there's an unlabeled brush down there that allows you to constrain the network based on the, the strength of connection between the different, uh, the different functions. And you can watch as the network deforms based on functions that always show up with other functions in blocks and functions that hardly ever show up with other functions in blocks. This will be much shorter, and I'll just get to the end because, like I said, I keep complaining about the lack of interactivity. I should have gotten over it by now. I'm still in the first stage of grief. Um, <laughs> one of the things I want to highlight is that we're still in Mike's world. Now, there's a big asterisk with all of this. First of all, this isn't 2,000 blocks. I said 2,000 blocks earlier. It's 1,000 blocks. It's all the blocks that have a thumbnail attached with them. So when you click on it, you'll see a little thumbnail image, the same thumbnail image from the, from the block itself, the kind of image that shows up when you look at a user's block page. I constrained it that way because 
1,000 is a lot easier to work with in the browser than 2,000. <clears> and as a result, it loses a lot of Ian's blocks because tributary is a huge uh, contributor to blocks. And it loses a lot of interesting blocks, some of my own. I tried, to, I tried to front load by adding thumbnails to all of my blocks, but the API didn't update soon enough, and so the data set that I worked with still only ended up with four or five of my blocks. Um, still, you see the patterns that I think are gonna hold out even as we deal with a larger, more inclusive data set. Everything in yellow here is Mike Bostock. Right, it's Mike's world, and we're just playing in it. Why is it, why is it that only three people have done anything on the island of strange projections besides Mike Bostock? Three with an asterisk, everything with an asterisk. It might turn out that as we clean up the data, as we get more in inclusive data, that some of these patterns will break down. We need better data. You know, I work in a library, I'm not a librarian, but I work in a library, and so I think that if you agree with me that this is a valuable way to look at our coding practice and our coding community, then that means we need to come up with better methods for actually curating these, these examples. And so Christoph's already started with this excellent gallery. But what can we do with blocks to, to provide more data to allow us to find more patterns? Like when that block was made or whether or not that block was forked from another, whether or not that gist was forked from another gist, to find these patterns of creation and creativity and try to identify better what it is that we're doing. That'll allow for more sophisticated analysis. This is very much a sort of early run, things that I could think of and work on on Memorial Day and leading up to it. I still think um, that once you play with this on, the, on that page, you'll see a lot of really interesting patterns, even with this very superficial view into the data. The better data also means go to Block Explorer, spelled Block Explorer. Here, I'll go f show the spelling just in case. Go to Block Explorer and put your GitHub name into the, into the little dialog box that it has on the front page that says, should we take a look at your blocks for D3 usage? So we get more examples and not just 26 users. And then I think deeper than that, and something I wanted to get into and point out as my sort of case study of recognizable patterns, is we need to start to think about what kind of maps we're making and how we're going about mapping in D3. You look at Christoph's gallery, it's got 236 examples of maps. And yet people in the D3 community, it looks like, now again, it could be bad data, but it looks like aren't coming from traditional mapping communities. If you go look at a Google Maps API meetup group, right? Or you go talk to people who use Google Maps API or Leaflet, then they'll tell you that they've got a master's degree in geography, they know about ArcGIS, they've got a degree in cartography, or they've spent time making maps professionally. People in the D3 user community are making some of the most innovative web maps without, it seems, reference to the map making community that's been around making complex data visualization for 40 years or 400 years or 4,000 years, depending on, on who you agree with. I think we really need to understand why it is that that traditional mapping community isn't more directly involved with using D3 as a, map, as a mapping uh, API. And I think part of the reason there, for anyone like me who's dealt with GeoTile and doing complex things with maps, we know that it's, it's not the most user-friendly thing from a mapping perspective. And so maybe somebody needs to expend some effort building a D3 map layer that provides a little bit more abstraction so that people can do that. Because once they're starting to build maps in D3, then they can start to build these incredible Voronoi globes like Jason Davies is building, or these incredible uh, route finding toys that, that Mike Bostock has been building. And use Topo JSON not just because it's, it's very lightweight, but because it's extremely powerful because it leverages topology. And then to get back to my whole social justice thing and trying to educate everybody, I think we need to question analytics more. I think that this is a more generic topic. Um, I can find a lot of patterns, and I could pretend like tandem bicycles and, and photography are the reason for success in the D3 community. And I could put together something that really is convincing, because heck, that pattern's there. There are a lot of patterns in there. Once you start to really deal with visualization of those complex patterns, 
that people are using to justify spending a lot of money and starting companies and doing stuff like that, then every time you do that, instead of visualizing a sort of flat data set in tabular format, you do a favor to people who realize, well, these things aren't reflections of reality. They're reflections of somebody's view into a particular, oftentimes really messy and questionable and asterisk filled data set. I think that's really valuable. So I guess I'm going to stop there. Like I said, a little bit short, but it'll work better on YouTube that way. Go back to the tandem bicycle and uh, offer myself up if anybody has any questions. The address again, in case you wanted to see it. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. In your function network, it strikes me that you might be able to find nodes that bridge together two superclusters. Absolutely. Are they finding the unicorn? Um, right. The key bases. player, the hide betweenness component. Yes. Well, neat visualizations that combine unexpected features of the library. Right. You can prompt people to say, well, why, why? You should go out and make a block that connects these two things at the end, and you should make a block that becomes the key player in this network. Right? I mean, that's, that's what I've been doing since I've been playing with this data for the last couple of weeks, is I've been writing blocks that do things like put a brush with a force layout and, and shock people, you know, cats and dogs living together. Yes, sir. I hear Python all the time when I'm around D3 people. And I don't know if it's because Python is there all the time or Python people are loudmouths. I don't know. But I don't think that it's a matter of how many people I expect, but rather what's the actual layout of it. If it's a small group or a large group, a small group can still be quite influential because of where the space that they occupy. It doesn't really matter the size of it. It's the topology of the, of the community that's most, that to me is most exciting. So here this thing is, that's interactive, you click on the topic name and it shows you some of these introductions that that topic comes from. So some of these, um, I needed it to move to be clear, move, right? Fell into topic number one. And so sometimes these topics aren't very useful because, because the, these are very short um, introduction text. But some of them, like the one that says PhD in research and UC in school and university, you notice that all of these introductions are people who are coming out of the academy and who are sitting at meetup groups trying to somehow integrate this in to their, to their practice. Right. Well, that's why, I mean, to tie them together, which is something that I've done, but I didn't want to present. It's too big of a network. But you can actually tie together individuals based on shared um, topic similarity. Create a network where the individuals are connected by shared uh, function use in their blocks and shared topic similarity. And you can see, you can get at, you know, with the data set, some idea of whether or not somebody actually knows what they're talking about when they claim to be an expert in something. Um, this is. Well, no, I, I, I think that Mike's vision for D3 has been one of the reasons for the success of D3. And that the fact that he keeps doing this stuff is not um, that nobody's doing anything with D3 except Mike Bostock. It's just that Mike is tremendously productive and shames us every time we go on Twitter as a result. <laughs> um, I just wanted to show off, because I was really proud of this. There's 1,000 nodes, and that's how responsive it is on, in the browser, right? Because, it, like I said, it's drawing the uh, it's drawing the, the nodes in SVG and the edges in Canvas. And if you, if you cut it to just certain edge weights, ooh, and if you do that enough, it slows down because it's doing a lot of different unoptimized things at the same time. But here we are looking at a network that's made up of blocks that are connected by between 6 and 11 functions. right? And you'll notice that the structure of the network is quite different. 
Um, what does it mean when blocks are strongly connected to each other by shared functions? Does it mean it's probably the same block with one minor uh, iteration? Does it mean that you're actually looking at a real community of practice? These are questions that I'm not going to be able to answer up here. And if you hover over things, you can go click on it and see that the uh, United States Postal Rate block by, I had to pick somebody whose name I'm not going to be able to pronounce, um, which we can look at, of course. Ooh. Sorry, Who knows where anything is on this computer? Uh, is connected to other blocks by a number of shared functions. So it's connected to the population pyramid block by six shared functions. It's connected to scatter plot. There's a really informative name of your block, whoever made that, <laughs> by five shared functions. And so you can start to, to, to try to describe what that means that things are connected by, uh, strongly connected by shared functions. And so that's the, that's the blocks view, the functions view, same kind of thing. And you can just sort of look at things that are just strongly connected. So these are functions that are all strongly connected with each other. We could uh, color it by whatever, whatever measures we made in, in Gephi beforehand. And so you can see that d3.json is strongly strongly co-occurs with d3.scale.linear, which itself strongly co-occurs with d3. d3.range, a function I have never used, is extremely highly represented because, of course, it allows you to create um, a random data set. But this idea that, that you know, an axis only exists over here, and maybe an axis is a bad example, but an ordinal scale is, doesn't seem like it's ever going to occur in a, in a geo visualization. These aren't things that I'm saying should happen, right? There should be an ordinal scale in, in a mapping visualization. But rather, it seems like an interesting question to ask why it doesn't. And sometimes the answer will be because that would, that's stupid. But I think that, off, that more often, the answer is going to be something a little more interesting. Yes, sir? I'm sorry? Oh yeah, I have before. I've, I've built lots of, so there are, there are multiple ways to do topic models as networks. One, the, the sort of traditional way is to connect documents to each other by shared strong connections between topics. Um, there's the tripartite, that sort of uh, uh, straight from the data tripartite network. I, well, you, you run into a hairball problem with it in the same way that you run into a hairball problem with the meetup data because Networks like that are, I mean, data like that is more amenable to something like primary components analysis and not to networks. You can trim it down until you see some structure, but by the time you've cut down, like, well, these are significant strength connections, you're doing a lot of authorship. And at, I get uncomfortable with that. So yeah, you can, and I think it's very useful. That's why I use networks to explain topic models. But um, I also thought there were kind of enough networks Anything else? Thanks, guys.